Okay, so we're going to talk about atonement. And the way we're going to talk about atonement is the way the preacher does it in Hebrews chapter 9, which he divides that chapter into two sections. First, he's going to talk about the architecture of the tabernacle and later, of course, the temple, and then the architecture of heaven, and then uh, which that alludes to. And then we will talk about how the actions of the priest in that environment uh, actually go through the rituals which uh, impart forgiveness of sins to the people of Israel and how, of course, then Jesus as the atoning sacrifice and great high priest is the final fulfillment and completeness of that atonement. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to jump back into Leviticus chapter 16 and read about the Day of Atonement. So that'll be Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8. Yep, Leviticus 16, verse 8. And actually, we'll back up to verse 5. Okay, so he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Israel. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. And he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of sweet incense, beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil, and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony, so that he does not die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side, and in front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, and you can follow this on the picture on the front to see where, you know, where he's standing when this takes place. So, of course, the altar of burnt offering is out in front. You have to come into the holy place to get to the incense altar. Uh, and there should be an arrow pointing east. So east, to the east is the entrance. Uh, you should take some of the bull and the vinegar. Uh, bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleannesses of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleannesses. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people of Israel. And when he has made an end of atonement for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. How far am I supposed to go? Uh, to 34, okay. Um, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel. But that took a while. And all their transgressions, all their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall bathe his body in water in a holy place and put on his garments. 
and come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. And he who lets the goat go to Ad- who lets the goat go to Azazel shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterwards he may come into the camp. And the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burned up with fire. And he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. And it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make atonement wearing the holy linen garments. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be a statute forever for you, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. Okay, so that is the mechanics of what has to happen on the Day of Atonement. So now we will go into uh, Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to split it up into a couple of parts. So we'll do Hebrews uh, 9, 1 to 10 first. Let's see how far we get. Okay, so before we read it, uh, so the preacher to the Hebrews, remember the book of Hebrews is, a, is an entire sermon unto itself. Uh, so this whole book is one single sermon. And he used chapters 7 and 8 to set up his analogy that he's going to make. And then the analogy he made was of the new covenant being the better covenant over the old covenant, some of which we just read about. Okay, the old covenant was always intended to be replaced. It was always intended as a placeholder and a temporary thing. And we're going to see why all this is and how all this is. And since Christ was not qualified to be an Aaronic priest, so we already heard what the Aaronic priest had to do on the Day of Atonement with offering his own sin offering and the offering for the sins of the people. Since Christ was not qualified to be an Aaronic priest because he was not a Levite, right? He's of the tribe of Judah. So he wasn't qualified to be an an Aaronic priest. He can't serve under the Old Covenant as a priest because it would have been in violation of the law. So he has to be something else. He has to be a priest of a different order. And then the priest showed us how he is of the order of Melchizedek, which uh, if you heard our conversation earlier about Melchizedek, you know, there's a lot of theories about who and what Melchizedek was. Um, from all the commentary and scholarship and, and what I've received of it, I'm convinced that Melchizedek is not a name, it's a title. You know, it's priest of the Most High God. It's a title. And the title was passed down father to son successively uh, from the time we read about Melchizedek coming out to Abram. And the king of Salem comes out, brings bread and wine. Significant. Yes, sounds like the Lord's Supper. So this king came out, this king and priest came out and blessed Abraham. And Abraham offered him a tithe and offering in return. So this order of Melchizedek is a different order of priesthood separate from the Levites. The law hadn't been given yet. So this order of Melchizedek is older and in fact goes back to the beginning, goes back to Adam. Adam was the first Melchizedek and it was passed down father to son through Shem. And at the time Abram went out to meet Melchizedek, the Melchizedek, that was probably Shem. Shem was still alive, so uh, Noah's son. Shem was still alive. If we want to put a name to it, Noah's son Shem was probably the Melchizedek. And then again, that was passed on to David, to David, to Joseph, to Christ. So Christ, and then it is, so you were established a high priest forever because Christ is alive forever. 
and that order is established from the beginning. So that's how he could be without birth, without mother, because it's a title, it's a position. Um, you don't have to agree with that. Your salvation does not depend on agreeing with what Pastor Steve says about Melchizedek. It's not critical, okay? Uh, but to me, that, that's what the evidence points to, that it's not a name, it's a title. And that would make sense. You know, how are you a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek? If he was just one guy and he never had parents or died, that's very enigmatic. That's very weird for, you know, somebody that was only mentioned in a few verses. The number of books and dissertations that have been written about this guy are fantastic. Uh, and this one that, uh, that, that it's Shem uh, has a lot of support in the early church. The early church fathers, if you care what Luther thought, Luther thought it was Shem also. Uh, I don't always agree with Luther. In this case, I do. He isn't always right. Luther isn't always right in this case. I agree with what Luther received it from the fathers, the church fathers. And I see nothing that points to something contrary, but it doesn't matter in the end of the day. Uh, as long as you understand the significance of Melchizedek's actions toward Abram, and how Jesus is also, that points forward to Jesus uh, in his actions. Enough about Melchizedek. We've already talked a lot about him, more than we probably should. Okay, but Jesus was not qualified to be an Aaronic priest, so he has to be something other, and the other is established for us in the inerrant word of God, in this person or position of the Melchizedek, who is the king of righteousness, the king of Salem. Okay, so now um, the preacher has uh, set up that analogy through chapter 7 and 8, talking about the Old Covenant, talking about the order of Melchizedek, who Christ is, how he fulfills all those things. And now chapters 9 and 10 are going to set up two more analogies. Chapter 9, as we mentioned, chapter 9 is going to talk about the place of worship. Chapter 10 is going to talk about the activities of that worship. And to the end of... That which is old is not dismissed, neither is it discarded. It is replaced. It is replaced not by something new, but something other. You know, that was God's intention from the beginning. The old way uh, was not going to be the only way because it was always pointing toward the Messiah. Okay, so we still need a priest. We still need God's house. We still need an atoning sacrifice. And they are all served to us better and completely by Christ and our worship today than it was the way God set it up for his people in the Old Testament. And that's all the preacher is pointing to. So right there in verse 1 of chapter 9, we will begin. Uh, so Hebrews chapter 9. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness, for a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence, it is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body, imposed until the time of reformation. And I'm going to keep going. Uh, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. 
For at the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And we'll stop at that point. Okay, so... So now the preacher is going to describe the place of worship, which is why you get the little, the little map. Okay, so both covenants, the old covenant and what we know now as the new covenant, has rules. It has procedures. Uh, it has furnishings. And it has a place that we set apart to do it. Right? So... We can look at some of the churches in, I'm on a Siberia kick, the Lutheran church in Siberia uh, right now. Did I talk about this before? So Siberia is huge. And there is a pretty faithful group of Lutherans in Siberia, you know, the, the wastelands of Russia, right? And under you know, the old communist regime, regime before the wall came down, uh, they went and took all the Lutheran pastors and they killed them. And so they're like, why don't they have any Lutheran pastors? And so they, Because they executed them all. So there's only a few guys now and they have to travel all over God's creation across like eight time zones is how big t- Siberia is. And there's only a few of these guys trucking around trying once a month to get to these little groups of faithful people uh, and bring them the Lord's Supper. So they might have a room in a house, but it's still a place. It's set apart. They clean it up nice. They might drape things with a white sheet. They set up a cross. They set up candles. They set up the elements of the Lord's Supper in whatever they have to hand to do it. It may not be gold-plated. It might not be something fancy, you know, from the lock cabinet in the back of mosaics. But it's the best they have, and they set that apart for that purpose. So they have rules, they have procedures, they have a place, and they have appointments or furnishings set apart to do this, just like we do. Just like they did in the Old Testament. They had the tabernacle, God gave them the design, how to construct it, what to make it out of, how to make the fabrics, what materials the fabrics had to be made from, how many rings had to be on it. Uh, He gave them the dimensions. He gave them uh, what layers to put first, how to put it up, how to tear it down, how to build the ark, how to make the ark exactly the way it was and what to put in it, and then how to store it, how to put it in the most holy place, and then how to divide it with the curtain, and how only the high priest, only one day of the year, could enter. So you had rules, procedures, things you had to do. Okay, so the practices of that old covenant and its design basically gives you, it's kind of like an onion, right? It's got its layers with the arc in the, it's not really in the center, it's to one side, but you think of an onion, these layers, and only certain people can move to this next layer till you get to the very center, only the high priest, only on the Day of Atonement, the most holy place where the ark is because that is where the glory of God actually comes to earth and rests on the mercy seat. Okay? Okay but it was separated by that veil. No one could see it except the high priest, except that one day of the year. And notice he even had to go in with incense smoke to make it foggy so it wasn't clear because he still couldn't behold that. No one can look on the glory of God in this world and live. Okay? So then the next chamber out, only the Levitical priests could enter where they offered sacrifices for their own sins and for the sins of the people, which they did daily. Uh, some people will argue that those daily, sin, those daily sin offerings didn't exist. If you go searching on the internet and searching uh, for more information than you ever want to know about this stuff, uh, you'll see people arguing about this. Uh, the writer, uh, Dr. Geishen, who wrote the Concordia commentary on Hebrews, uh, goes into exacting detail and points you to resources to show, yeah, they really did offer these sacrifices. Uh, there's a lot of nonsense out there. Just so if anybody ever tells you, no, they never offered these daily sin offerings, yes, they did. And there's tons of evidence for it. Uh, and I leave that to people that can actually, are actual Hebrew scholars that can read this stuff in the original, which is not me. I'm not an old, unfortunately, not an Old Testament scholar. 
Okay. In this way, the people of the old covenant, the people of Israel, could remain in the covenant of the law, despite their inability to keep the law, right? Because as soon as you break the law, you've broken the covenant, right? I mean, if you make rules in a contract and you don't follow one of those rules, you, you're in breach of contract, right? Same thing with God's law. As soon as we sin, we've broken the contract we have with God, which is, this is what I expect you to do. And if you don't, you will die. And he instituted, he gave the law and he gave this um, way of achieving atonement for sins so that these people could remain in the covenant, even though they cannot keep the law. We don't think about it that way because we're in the new covenant and we think about it in a different way, which the writer to the Hebrews, again, preaching to Jewish converts, early Jewish converts to Christianity, he's explaining to them, okay, this is how you were raised. This is how it is now. It's the same, but it's different. And here's how, which is really what he's doing. Everybody follows that, right? Okay. So in this case, it's actually easy for us to understand because we're looking backwards going, yeah, that was just weird, and we have Jesus. <laughs> and it's much simpler, because it is. It's much, much simpler. All right, so you had to have these daily sin offerings because that's how the people remained in the covenant with God, even though they are sinners. So this took place every day? Every day. Not the Day of Atonement was once a year. But every day, sin offerings for the priests and for the people were offered. And that's when people will say, no, no, that only happens on the Day of Atonement. No, that happened every day. But the Day of Atonement was a big statute that God said, you will have this forever. Uh, but yeah, and, and, and that's what scholars argue about. Well, they didn't do it every day. Uh, it, there's tons of evidence that say, yes, they did these sin offerings every day. Okay, so these two chambers that we see are furnished, as we said, with unique, specialized furniture. And that's what we call stuff in the church. Like, what do you call the lectern and the altar and the pulpit? It's furniture. We have, it's called furniture. So this, we have this unique furniture, specialized furniture, like the, the oil lamp, like the table of the showbread, the bread of the presence, uh, the incense altar, the Ark of the Covenant being the most special, uh, the most holy thing that they have. And again, only the priests saw some of this, and only one priest saw all of it. And even then, he had to look at it as through a fog. Kind of makes you wonder how they moved it. <laughs> yeah, it kind of does. <laughs> I think it had a lot to do with the fact when the, when, the, when the camp stopped, because if you read the way it was happening in Exodus, whenever the camp stopped and they erected the tabernacle and the cloud of the presence came down, that's when you couldn't go in. So when they're moving around, then it's a piece of furniture. Then it's unoccupied. Yeah, then it's unoccupied. Then he's not on the mercy seat. If he's on the mercy seat, you're going to die. <laughs> so don't look at it. So it wasn't actually the art people couldn't look at. It was the presence of God. that they I would say, yeah, it was the actual, it would be the, the glory cloud, which when you're following it in the wilderness, that's different. But once it came, comes down, that, that's no. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's one of those things that's a little bit... Uh, paradoxical but I don't think we need to get too hung up on it it's like when it's in motion it's okay once it stops then that's okay now God is present you don't go in there kind of makes sense but yeah good question it's, that is something that's confusing people and it's one of the things people want to point to see and see the Bible is not internally consistent like, no no if you interpret it correctly it's perfectly internally consistent just remember it's God's reasoning, not ours. And we try to anthropomorphize God because that's what we do. We anthropomorphize our pets. You know, we attribute human emotions to our pets because that's how we, we engage the world. So we talk to our pets like they're people. Sometimes they understand us. Sometimes they have no clue and all they hear is beep, 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 beep. And we interpret what they say to us like we know what they're saying and we don't. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Especially cats, because cats are weird. But we do that. We anthropomorphize everything, including God, and can't do that because God is God. He's outside time and space. He is. He created us, so he can do whatever he wants. So he's like, oh, how can God do that? Because he's God. Because he's God, and we can't comprehend that. That's why. 
but that's a tangent, sorry. All right, so specialized things, specialized actions. And now the preacher begins explaining, okay? So like in about verse eight, the Holy Spirit spoke through Moses, giving all of these things for their divinely intended purpose. Although they're not all fully revealed, not yet. We don't get that until Christ. Okay, like again, only not everybody could behold these things, right? Not everybody, not every Jew in the wilderness could march up and go, check, I'm going to check out the ark behind the curtain. You know, you're going to die. I mean, that's why the, the high priest tied a rope around his waist in case he screwed up because the next guy can't go in and get his body out. They have to pull him out by the rope. That's what it was for in case he screwed up. All right. You know, we saw that. I forgot who their names are. They offered improper fire. They decided, I'm going to offer incense, an incense offering. God didn't want that, so he killed them. Seems harsh, but that was the way God interacted in the Old Covenant. It was very strict. All right, so the Holy Spirit gives these furniture and fixtures through Moses to the people. And this is one of our evidences that all Scripture is, one, inspired by God, and two, good for instruction. It teaches us something even today. Okay, so all of this stuff as the kids will say in confirmation especially all that stuff in leviticus that doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. because if you just read it all you're just going to go uh, why do i have to read this because you have the christian freedom to not have to do any of that stuff but it teaches us things and you know it teaches us what's clean and unclean it teaches us the things that god gave to people to protect them like why aren't you supposed to eat oysters and shrimp what was the big deal because those things suck up heavy metals and they'll kill you, even back then. So not eating that kept people healthy. You know, why do you have to go show the priest when you got a funny spot with a hair of a certain color growing out of it? Because that stuff's contagious and that presents the, prevents the spread of disease. That's why you have to go wash, you have to go isolate yourself, quarantine for a time, and then you can go back and the priest goes, oh yeah, it's gone, you're good, you can rejoin the assembly. It was for the public health. So it wasn't all religious architecture. It wasn't all religious uh, rites and rituals. It was also for the good of the people in a constricted area traveling for a number of years. The public health was important. That applied to cloven hooves too. It did. Trichinosis. Yep. 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 So that's why pork. No bacon because worms. worms. Actually, Wait, yeah, tr back up. yeah, trichinosis, trichinosis worms. <laughs> back up. From reading, not cooked in a pork chop now. Oh no! Now, now <laughs> I think now I believe they've pretty much eradicated that. If I'm not wrong, yeah, you, so you even if you good. even if your pork's a little pink, it's still good. You're not gonna get worms. But I actually know somebody who says he knows somebody who's got that, and you never get rid of it. So you can actually see little things moving, and it's hell disgusting. Like ew. They just know how to cook pork. Tasty. I guess. Yeah, it's very painful. I've had a lot of different foods living in the South, and pig's feet is not one I have acquired a taste for. That's, that's, that's right up there with pickled herring being another one of those Nordic delicacies. My mom could eat jars of that stuff. It's like, that's disgusting. Ugh, it's right up there with lutefisk. But you can do grits, right? Hmm? You can do grits. I can do grits. Grits are grits, yeah. Yeah, they clean your teeth. Yeah. <laughs> Grits, hominy, all of the above. All that stuff's good. Chitlins, both kinds. I prefer the fried kind. The fried kind are better. The slimy kind have to be made by somebody that knows what they're doing. Because otherwise, that's nasty. So you want to order a little fisk for your birthday. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Or like that, that fermented shark that they eat in Iceland, which I swear they only make it for tourists. Because they, they, it's rotten shark. And they hang it up, and they're, they have ordinances. You can't make this stuff within so many miles of the city center. <laughs> so what does that tell you how bad this stuff smells? Must be like kimchi. No, no that stuff can be pretty good. <laughs> kimchi is good. This is nasty. This is like pure ammonia in fish food. No. Literally. And so I, okay, so sidetrack. But I was watching Andrew Zimmer, the weird foods guy. So he goes to Iceland, and he's like catching puffins and all this stuff. He's like, okay, I could go out of town to try this fermented shark and this guy like 
carves off a piece for him and hands him this little square. And he's already, his eyes are watering, just standing there. <laughs> and, you know, he'll try anything. He'll eat yeah. anything. And he puts it in his mouth, and he's crying as he's chewing. He goes, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever put in my mouth. I, and, and he goes, I love it because he tried it. And it's like, oh, I'm, I'm feeling sick for him yeah. watching his face. So, no, there's things you should not eat, and I don't know why those people, I guess they're really frugal. Anyhow. Make money off tourists. That's what it's got to be for tourists. I, I, I thought that the other kind of chip ones was the slimy kind was for tourists. It's like, oh, yeah, you can, we'll get them to eat this stuff. Those weren't clean, right? Yeah, well, the, the fella I knew, his wife, of course, would not let them be cooked in the house. He had a trailer out back that was only for making chitlins from beginning to end. And, you know, there's many boilings that have to take place before you eat these things. And you didn't go in that trailer because it was abominable. But they were good. They were good. They're, they did not cook one single thing that was not delicious. So. Can't be any worse than ramps. Than what? Ramps to West Virginia. Was that? It's like a wild onion. Wild onions. Yeah. We have them in our woods. I got yeah. My right. neighbor boy used to eat them. He was, they were from West Virginia. They love them. Or are they like wild wild really, really yeah. strong oh, or ramps. something? Yeah. They call, yeah. And are they so strong, strong that when you come to church with us, we'd have them sit yeah. away from <laughs> I kind of want to try it. I had a Chinese fellow that used to work for me. Do you remember Chi? Yes, of course I remember. He used to eat garlic. I mean, literally just take a clove of garlic and like peel it like an yeah. apple and, and pop cloves in and chew it. And that stuff was just coming out of his pores. Yeah. I finally told him one day, it's like, I'm sitting like 10 feet from him. My eyes are watered. It's like, it's like, Chi, you cannot eat garlic like that and keep working here. You're killing us. It's like the whole office is just a funky cloud of garlic. Unbelievable. But he's like, oh, yeah, it's good for you. It's like, yeah, it's good for you, but it's not good for anybody else. <laughs> Stop. It's, 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 it's benefits. Oh, yeah, it's got all kinds I of health benefits. a Hungarian friend, and he would purposely eat a lot of garlic, mm -hmm. so his wife wouldn't let him go to confession. Let's see. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Where's that one about anything in excess? <laughs> yeah, anything in excess, absolutely. Okay, so side trip to, about unclean foods aside. Uh, so all... This is one of our evidences that all scripture is the inspired word of God and is good for our instruction. What is it teaching us? It teaches us about things that are important. Okay, so all of these chambers and barriers, the curtains, the veils that we see, barriers to entry, you know, things you have to do, which I should be the red flag right now, something I got to do to approach God. That ain't how this works because I'm saved by grace through faith, not by my works. So you have to be of this clan and you have to be this head of the clan to get to this point. Only that one guy can do it. So all this stuff is teaching us that the way to God, because he's right there on the mercy seat, the way to God, the real way to God has not been revealed yet. That's what that teaches us, that God's plan is incomplete in the Old Testament. This is a shadow. We talked about that foreshadowing. This is a shadow of fulfillment in Christ. So that's what all of this stuff in Leviticus teaches us. Uh, which I have to remember to use that with my confirmation kids. This is what it teaches us. But it's still useful for instruction. So when we study the law, and by the law we mean all that stuff in Leviticus, we learn about God's plan for Israel, the way the law paints the picture of Christ's fulfillment of that plan, but not quite, not complete, not yet. So as long as the tabernacle is in use when we're reading the Old Testament, it serves as a big billboard, like there was a big billboard in the desert that shows us how Israel's sin, and therefore our sin, is our barrier to approaching God. You know, we can't, we can't come close. We can't go behind the curtain, right? The solution to that sin has still not been given. Sins are forgiven through the sacrifices. They can still remain in the covenant. They're still God's people. But that billboard says what we learned from our Old Testament reading last Sunday is wait quietly and patiently because it's not yet. It will be fulfilled, but not yet. And the solution, of course, is Christ, right? The solution is Jesus. So in verses 9 to 10, all of these sacrifices, all of these rituals do nothing to cleanse the worshiper's conscience, which 
we love talking about conscience. Luther loved talking about conscience. And it seems to come up all the time. Because your sins are forgiven, but the guilt of sin remains. That has not been cleansed. So a worshiper, an Israelite, participating in worship in the Old Covenant, never experienced that relief from the guilt of sin, only that limited and temporary sense of my sins are forgiven today. And then tomorrow we got to offer another sacrifice. And the day after that, we got to offer another sacrifice. And then on the big one, we all have to get together and all those things we can't remember, all those unintentional sins, all those other sins, we got to lay them on the goat and send it out in the wilderness for the devil to take because we're still sinners. We still have that. We're still carrying that around, that guilt. Because they knew that future sin would require future sacrifice. Right? They could never feel fully clean. You know, it's kind of like, it is a not really because Luther didn't understand the gospel yet. It's kind of like when he's going to confession and he had to remember every stupid little thing he did. How much sinning do you think these guys did in a monastery? <laughs> no, I mean, they're guys. So I bet they figured stuff out and they did brew beer. So, <laughs> But you know, how much sinning are these guys got where they're waking up seven times a night to go pray, right? And yet they still... I, I got unconfessed sins and he'd run right back into confession right after he got out and got absolved because he had that guilt, that sin guilt, blood guilt of his sins because he never felt truly clean because he knew he'd have new sins to confess, right? Because he didn't understand grace and faith yet. You know, great, the forgiveness of sins and receiving it by grace. So that's the same problem the Old Testament people had. They never felt truly cleansed. None of those sacrifices solved the problem of sin. They washed the sin away, but they didn't solve the problem. They were a treatment, but they weren't a cure. So they were band, it was a band-aid. It was a band-aid. You take off a band-aid and that carry away the dirt of that sin, and you gotta slap another band-aid on right away because you sinned again. Okay? The only way to know true freedom from the guilt of sin is for God Himself to cleanse your conscience to apply Christ's perfect righteousness to your conscience. And that's the difference between the law and grace. Because the law says, do this, I can't do this. Do this sacrifice to pay for the guilt of that, to pay for the consequence of the sin. Okay, now do this. The law still says do this. I can't. Okay, they offer this sacrifice. Repeat, cycle, cycle, cycle. Okay? That's the law. The law only accuses. The law always accuses us of sin. It reminds us that we need atonement. By grace, and we're going to talk about that later in the chapter, I'm probably getting ahead, but by grace we're made to be righteous by Christ's sacrifice. His perfect once for all atoning sacrifice on the cross for you, for your sins, where God applies Christ's perfect righteousness to you because your righteousness is anything but perfect. But it doesn't matter because that's dead. You're covered with Christ's righteousness. That's all he sees. All he sees is his perfect son. So now, ah, oh, my conscience is clear because yes, I'm still sinning, but Christ has it covered. He covers me. It's just like that cloud that covers the most holy, the, the mercy seat, so the priest can't look on it. The, the uh, righteousness of Christ covers your sin, so the Father doesn't see it. It's like it doesn't exist because it's covered, it's clean, it's gone. All right? So now, here in verse 11, now the preacher to these Roman Hebrews is going to talk about the greater tabernacle of the new covenant. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, and I, I forgot where in this Bible the footnotes actually get explained. I think it's in the back. It is in the back. It's a weird Bible. Hang on a second. I just want to look something up. Hebrews 9.11. Hebrews 9.11. And I actually have to look at number five. Some manuscripts, good things to come. Yeah, so... When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come or the good things to come, uh, the Greek could be constructed either way, probably, is why they have that note, because I don't have the Greek in front of me tonight. Uh, it doesn't matter if he's talking about a future. It's, it's, a, theori it's, a, the it's a theological present, 
So it's a thing that is happening and continues to happen. Uh, you can think of it that way. Uh, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Okay? So this tabernacle is not found on earth. So I don't mean to yell at you. That this, this tabernacle is not found on earth. And that gets back to what you and I were talking about earlier, about the construction of the, the sanctuary, why we do the things in liturgy we do, uh, why our church is built this way, because they're modeled after heaven. Okay, They're modeled after the visions we see in the Old Testament and things like Ezekiel, and then the visions that John received in Revelation. So we do what we do, kind of because they did it in the Old Testament, but that was modeled after heaven, right? God gave them to the design for the tabernacle and, and then the... Uh, Temple. The temple was modeled after that because they're built on the blueprint of the holy places in heaven. So that's it's a copy or a facsimile, whatever you want to call it. You know, so that design, you can read Revelation and you get that same picture. The same exact picture. Except instead of the most holy place with a curtain in front of it, you have the lamb who looks like he was killed, but he's alive. Seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow. Okay. So I lost my place. What was I talking about? Oh, so that tabernacle is not found on earth. That tabernacle is only found in heaven. It's not built with human hands. God gave the design, but men built it out of earthly things. Okay? This one is instead built by God. Okay? It's the master. The earthly one is patterned after it, whether it's our sanctuary, whether it's the tabernacle, the first temple, the second temple, whatever. And even to a lesser degree, uh, well, synagogues are modeled after it still. Um, even mosques, they have a design similar to it. But of course, they use, the Old Testament is their Bible also, along with the Quran. So even even the, in Islam, their their mosques are built to uh, a blueprint based on the heavenly designs that we've received in Scripture. So not everything they do is evil. <laughs> okay. They're just wrong about a lot of stuff. Uh, and, and they're worshiping the wrong God, but that's a subject for a different day. Uh, in, when you're looking at this in the Holy of Holies, mm -hmm. <coughs> pardon me, that, it's like in, Revelation, in Revelation 20, uh, 20, 20, 20 21. 21. <laughs> yeah. yep. That is the new heaven, the, uh, new Jerusalem is square. Mm -hmm. It is square, and the Holies of Holies. Yeah, is, the, is a square. It is a square. Yeah, because yeah, if you look at it, it's two squares side by side. Mm -hmm. So, and then the yeah, there's prepared, the, and then the yeah, and then the holy of holies is a square inside of that. It's That's all, what I meant. The holy yeah. all of this would not be necessary. Yeah, it, it, you know, yeah, just the inner court is a know, square. I mean, it's right. well, we don't even need that. You know, we do, we do. Mm -hmm. oh, this is gone. You know, all we need is this little. The holies are holies. Yep. That is the it's a square. Yeah. yeah. So the New Jerusalem itself, the city, is a right. square. It is the holy of holies. All right. And there is no temple because you don't need it anymore. Yeah, right. Why? Because right. of Jesus. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So yeah, that's beautiful. We well, yeah, we tend to only read that in at funerals for some reason, at least in in the Lutheran tradition. Uh, I wish we read that more in the lectionary at certain times. Uh, it's just good to hear that because we forget about the new earth. We all think we die, we go to heaven, and that's our existence. We're going to be sitting in the heavenly court singing for the rest of our lives. And that's, no, there's a new earth where we're going to be people like he created us to be in the first place. Like Adam and Eve were when we, they were perfect before they fell into sin. We're going to have jobs to do. We're going to have vocations. Don't know what they're going to look like. Don't know what they're going to be. But it's going to be interesting. But you're, you're not going to be an a angel singing forever. I mean, I just because I see that's what his design was before the fall. You know, Adam and Eve had jobs. They had vocations. They had things to look after. They were stewards of the earth. There's going to be a new earth, and he's going to intend us to be stewards of that. A new creation, new universe, which we'll actually get to maybe see more of it instead of one planet. I don't know. It's fun to think about that stuff. I know it doesn't matter. But <laughs> like we're going to live forever, so the whole time it takes to travel places isn't going to matter. It, Maybe somebody should do like a Christian science fiction novel about what it's like after. I don't know. I don't think any of us would. Um, 
minds that we have and even in vision. Right. Yeah, no. Yeah, it's, it's impossible it's because impossible. we have no frame of reference, you know, speaking of we compare everything with our with what we have here. Exactly. We have no frame of reference because we're sinners. We only know what a broken world is. It's probably why a story about what life would be like in the new earth would be boring because there's no sin, there's no conflict, and that's how all our entertainment is based. You can't have a story without conflict, right? You can't have no plot. We don't understand. How would that be entertaining? Everything's perfect. Sounds dreadful <laughs> for, for a plot device. I don't know. Again, that's a whole... I should probably like email that to some of the talking heads that do these Lutheran podcasts. Like, talk about this. See where you guys go with it. It'd be interesting. Um, so, again, the master's in heaven. The copy is here on earth. So the earthly model is a teaching model, as we said. All of this scripture was written for our learning, so there's something we can learn from these blueprints we're given to give us an idea of a foreshadowing of what the heavenly uh, Jerusalem will be like and then eventually the new Jerusalem. So it's a teaching model also. And the way I think of it is, maybe it's a bad example, but at the seminary, we have what's called the teaching chapel. And it's a sanctuary, just like ours. You know, it's got the chancel, lectern, pulpit, and then more cameras than you can believe and big screens and video editing stuff so that every move you make is from every angle and they can frame by frame show you everything you did wrong <laughs> because you are supposed to turn in one direction and don't about if you've been in the military they do an about face when they turn around and they t try to yell that out of you so all the guys that were military were doing like the heel to toe about face like stop doing that no no so you have this teaching chapel why it's set up like a real uh, a real uh sanctuary so that you can learn how to do the things that you're supposed to do in worship because, why? Because you have to be taught them because they matter. If it didn't matter, they wouldn't teach them to you. So it wouldn't matter which way you turn. And does it matter which way you turn? Are you guys going to notice if I turn in the wrong direction? I notice when I do it because I'm thinking about it. You know, I always turn to the left and turn back this way. So if I turn, I turn to my left to you, I turn to my right to face the altar because that's the way I was taught. Does that actually signify anything? It makes it look ordered. So if anybody goes, oh, yeah, he always turns this way, he always turns that Nobody does that. Okay, nobody does that. But somebody who likes that kind of stuff will go, yeah, well, that's good. I notice you always turn the same way because uh, somebody has ADHD and notices that stuff. So that's extreme. But they teach you how to read, how to hold your hands. Now, does that mean you're going to hold your hands millimeter precise? like the Roman Catholic Church does, where the priests have to put their fingers together once they have consecrated the elements, and these three fingers never come apart till the end of the service of the sacrament. Why? Because if you take them apart, people's sins are forgiven. I don't know, they, because they have to do it that way. Because it's, a, it's, because it's a rule, and because they're legalists, and everything's rules. Everything's rules, and you have to follow the rules. Uh, and it's beautiful if you can do that without dropping stuff. Okay, and there are Lutheran traditions and rules for the Lord's Supper that people would see and go, wow, that's really Roman Catholic, why is he doing that? Or, oh, that's really, really nice because you can do the whole ornate ceremony with the genuflecting at the words of consecration uh, where you actually lower yourself at the altar, the elevation of the elements, which I do, some people don't, uh, where you actually, you know, you know, on the night in which he was bread, or Lord took bread, and you hold up the bread to go, this bread, okay? It's all order, because they're to focus your eyes on the bread, to focus your eyes on the chalice, on the blood. So everything teaches, everything does something. There's a reason for it, that's why they teach it, for good order. And again, we're Lutheran, and that's one of the words in our confession, that it, our confession just comes up at time and time, done in good order, to be done with good order for all things in good order. I mean, that phrase comes up over and over and over again. So if you ever want to say, because we're Lutheran and that's what we do, because they even have a neat Latin phrase for it. And it translates as, as you pray, so you believe, which sounds weird, but sounds cooler in Latin. Uh, and what that means is, as you worship, the way you worship tells people what you believe. So... If you just let any old thing happen up there, that means this, this is not that important, is the way we look at it. So that's why liturgical. 
That's why we've been doing it that way for 2,000 years for a reason, because it's modeled after the way the priests handled things in the tabernacle and the temple, because it's modeled after the way worship takes place in heaven. That's why. Sure, because in, in the early part of the Old Testament, all the rules, what is it, Leviticus, all mm -hmm. the rules are, uh, God is very precise about everything. Yeah. Perfection. Perfection. You know, to the what threads can your clothes be made of? And can you have a synthetic blend, right? You're not going to have any of this acrylic cotton abomination in the Old Testament. First of all, they didn't have acrylic, but you, you couldn't have two different kinds of fabric in certain garments. Uh, the, you had to have a certain number of tassels. And then the, you get into the Midrash and the Jewish oral tradition. It has even more rules about how many threads are in those tassels. How many... You know how many how many threads are there supposed to be? There's a symbolic number, and there's a reason for it, and they wrote that stuff down. That's why, because it teaches something. We may not think it's important, but the stuff God taught us is important because it shows us something and points us towards something better that exists in heaven. That is the not yet. Of course, Christ had something to say about that. And Christ did have something to say about that. And, and he had something to say about all the rules they made up. Like, as if the rules God gave you were that easy to keep, you made up a whole bunch of new ones. Isn't that dumb? Yeah, got it. Jesus had a few things to say about that. Okay, so it, it, what you do teaches something. And what you do in our tradition, in our confessions, and in many Protestant other Protestant confessions, and many religions around the world, what you do, your acts and your rituals, tell something about what you believe. All right? I mean, if everybody is real, real careful with the elements from the Lord's Supper, so even when communion's over and the service is done and everybody's handling it very carefully and very respectfully, they must believe that is something still. Like it's actually the, still the body and blood of Christ and maybe we should treat it like such. Instead of, oh yeah, just throw that out which gives people apoplexy when they see someone that's like near to the altar, they'll just like dump it, and like just meh. It's just like you pour out a leftover and they go, don't do that. Like why? Well, this is why. That's why. So yeah, you, get, you even get excited about it. All right, so all of that. So in accordance with the law, the ironic, ironic, not ironic, ironic high priest entered the most holy place with his basin of sacrificial bull's blood. He sprinkled it on the mercy seat upon the ark to atone for the sins of Israel. So, of course, that is patterned after something that hasn't happened yet. I love this language. So this is this action by the high priest on the mercy seat is patterned after Jesus' sacrifice and spilling of blood for us on the cross, which hasn't happened yet for them. But, you know, it's God, so it's outside of time. So, because in heaven, it's already happened. So, his action there is patterned upon Christ's sacrifice, which will happen when the Messiah comes. And the sacrifice that Christ will perform on, you, am I going too long? What? It's okay. Pardon me. Is, am I boring anybody yet, or am I rattling on too long? Well, I get lost once in a while, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Say something when I do that. Don't be afraid. Okay, so this, this application of blood to the mercy seat is patterned upon Christ's sacrifice that he will perform in the heavenly tabernacle, which is not of this world. Okay? What sacrifice did he perform? I thought it was on the cross. Well, when it's completely finished, when Jesus says it is finished and he gave up his, returned his spirit to God that was placed on him in his baptism. And when he died, the, when the God man, Jesus Christ died at that instant, he is enthroned at the right hand of the father in heaven because that's heaven. We can't think about it like people, you know, it's like, well, yeah, he was in the grave for three days. He was also at the right hand of God. Don't. One of those things, don't try to comprehend it because we can't, because he's God. So at that instant, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, and the plan is complete at that moment. So at that moment, the vision we see in Revelation of the lamb that looks like a dead, it's been slaughtered, but it's 
alive. That is the moment, boom, where the son is enthroned at the right hand of God. Uh, some people, like, who are these people you keep saying? These some people, some people use John 20, verses 16 and 17, don't have to look at it now, to argue when the atonement took place. So, like, did it happen at the moment Christ died, in the moment he's enthroned, in the moment? You know, don't talk about time because the risen Christ is outside time and space because he's God. Right. We said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, but in a minute I'm going to die and I'm going to be in the grave for three days. But you'll be with me in paradise at that time. It's not a contradiction. He's God. He's outside of time and space. He exists in all times and places because he's God. It's a neat trick. We can't do that. We have no frame of, again, frame of reference. That's what Einstein always talked about with relativity frames of reference. How does it look like this is moving into somebody else? It looks like it's going real slow. Frames of reference. If you're standing on a train platform and you see a train go by, all you see is a blur. But if you're on a train moving next to that train going a little slower, it doesn't look like that other train's moving that fast relative to you. And if you're in a head-on collision, that looks a whole lot different than bumping into somebody when you're both going about the same speed. Relative speeds, it doesn't seem that violent. It's just getting bigger. Right. So, frames of reference. We have no frame of reference to not being bound by time, which goes from the past to the future. I'm not bound by that. All right. So, today you will be with me in paradise as I'm sitting at the right hand of the Father. As I say, it is finished. It all happened for you, and it is complete. And that's what we have to understand. It is finished, and it is finished for you. Okay, so Jesus' atoning sacrifice is greater than any animal sacrifice because Jesus is infinitely better than any sacrificial animal, right? Animal sacrifices atoned for the sins of the Jews in their flesh. And again, the law and grace. The law says you have to offer this sacrifice for your sins. This flesh has to bleed to atone for your sins of your flesh. But your spirit, your conscience is still convicted by the law and we have to do this tomorrow because the problem of sin is not fixed. Jesus' sacrifice atoned for the sins of flesh and the spirit. And by that I mean it required a human life lived perfectly, following that law perfectly, and then it required a human sacrifice to be equal to the human sacrifice you would have had to have been making for yourself, for your sins, because the penalty of sin is your death, your eternal death. So in your place, a human being had to die, just happens to be also God. And once for all the sins of the world, that human sacrifice was made. And oh, the good news is he didn't stay dead because he's God. All right. So he lived that human life perfectly without sin. His defeat of the devil's temptation taught us something else. Okay. It proved his resolve to keep his father's will. So not like the goat sacrificed to Azazel and cast out into the wilderness with all the sins of the world on it to die. Jesus went out into the desert and he beat the devil and he had his own game and came back. All right. So he remained obedient to the Father. His death was undeserved. So his death was an acceptable substitute payment for you. All right. And the Father is willing to apply Christ's payment to you and to anyone's account who believes that Jesus is paying that debt for you. So do you believe Jesus did it for you? Then it is done as you believe. If you don't believe it, no, we got to work on that, right? Because Jesus' blood can cleanse the conscience of the guilt of sin as well as the sin itself. The problem of sin is solved. That's why it had to be Jesus. That's why it had to be a man, why Jesus had to come into our flesh, why he had to live that perfect life and then be sacrificed, okay? So the weight of the guilt of the law is finally lifted from us. 
And then with our sins forgiven, we are now free to serve that living God by our good works for the purpose of the edification of our neighbor and making his life better. Okay, so sin is to condemnation as Christ is to eternal life. For anybody that remembers taking like their high school test, right? They had the equivalent, make those equivalencies. So sin is to condemnation as Christ is to eternal life. And next week we'll finish chapter 9 as we talk about the new covenant in Christ's blood, which is going to be a lot more of the same of this. We won't quite take as long. Okay, questions? That's where we'll leave it for this week.